Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Brother Ron with us. We, uh, uh, Brother Ron and I go back as friends before Angel and I married. And um, I have, over the years, prior to pastoring, I preached a total of 37 weeks of revival at his man's church. This is where we went five straight weeks and uh, tapped into things that we never knew uh, that uh, I, I didn't know what to do. We had no clue what was going to happen one night to the next other than gangbangers came in, falling under the power of God, Hallelujah. teenagers laying out in the spirit to one o'clock in the morning. Uh, we, we just left them laying there and just went on next door to his, to his house. The parsonage is connected uh, from, his, from the side door of the church to that door is about where his house is. So, uh, so we've been together. We've been together through good times, through battles and warfares. Matter of fact, he joked one time and said, uh, told Angel, he said, I think I spent more time with your husband this year than you did. <laughs> and, uh, and that wasn't too far off when you only averaged eight nights a month home. And him and I traveled, I don't know how many places together. And uh, so we were gone a lot. And uh, so I'm, I'm thankful. I trust him. And uh, he's been good. Uh, I'm very proud of this man. I've never, never, I don't, and sure it's happened before, but it's not common. Uh, Brother Ron's been flying for years. He's the one who really uh, put me into an airplane the first time back in 2005. Uh, my, I think I took up over a year to get it because I traveled so much. He put me in an airplane, and uh, I watched him fly all these years and do all that stuff. And uh, to become a certified flight instructor at age 71, it is supernatural. Amen. I don't know anybody else that's ever done that at age 71. Uh, it's a young man's game to do what he did, the stress and the pressure and everything that goes with it. And uh, so he did it not to make another living out of it. He did it to help people. He did it to help missionaries that come in here. He did it to be a blessing. Uh, I pray that he'll be able to make money and, and uh, to do it. But his heart was as a kingdom event, do something for the kingdom. And uh, this church, uh, over a year ago, he, pre he was here and I had him preach and and uh, we sowed into that. And so I just want, uh, I told Brother Ron, I was out this weekend and, and uh, being at Pastor David's and there's some few things on my heart I want to share, but I want him to just come and greet you. And I know he's got some words of thanks and, and uh, but not only that, I know he's a holy man and I know that God, uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stand here without saying something. I believe that God want to encourage the people with amen so a man that i love and respect and honor greatly is ron wick come on give him a hand amen love you yeah well praise the lord i think i heard someone say that god is good amen i know he's really been good to me amen so god is a good god sometimes I wake up in the mornings and I see all the blessings of God and think about his goodness and his kindness and his mercy. And I just say, God, you're just, you're just too good to me. <laughs> Amen. And our salvation's too good to be true, but it's true anyway. Amen. So first of all, I want to uh, give a word of thanks and gratitude for the tremendous uh, offering that I received while I was here uh, last year. And uh, that was a huge surprise to me. I think it's a huge surprise that Brother Kent, <laughs> but uh, this went a long ways in helping uh, pay for the training for the certified flight instructor uh, license, and so I just want to say thank you, and I know though, there were those uh, listening on social media that also uh, sent in offerings, and so we just want to say thanks, amen. And so it is a, a great uh, honor to uh, be here, I always look forward to being here, spending time with you and with Brother Ken and Sister Angel and their family. And I always feel like I'm coming home. This is kind of my second home. And we thank you for making us feel at home here. So we appreciate your love and hospitality. And so what Brother Ken said is true. There's not many people uh, my age that get a certified flight instructor's license. And 
So <clears throat> it's really a, a God thing. And, uh, but uh, I really uh, never let age interfere with my plans so much, you know. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> I always got a little, uh, I've never been like in the proper sequence of things. But uh, I was raised in rural Arkansas, and uh, we never got the memo on child labor laws. <laughs> and so I started working on the farm in the summers when I was 11 years old. And uh, I remember the first day they put me on a big tractor, the Minneapolis Moline tractor, and it's an 80-acre field. And the boss man drove off. And it was just me in that 80-acre field there, you know, and I was just 11 years old. So, hey, I'm getting with it on that tractor, and, and I saw a truck come down the road, and he threw on the brakes, you know, and I'm thinking, what's his deal? Then I realized he thought it was a runaway tractor. They couldn't see me on it. <laughs> so I stood on my tiptoes and, and waved my cap and whatever so they'd know that somebody was actually on the tractor. It wasn't a runaway. <laughs> So I started a a little bit young, uh, and the Lord uh, blessed me. I started teaching uh, college, University of Arkansas, when I was uh, 22 years old, and finished my Ph.D. degree when I was uh, 26, and uh, that was kind of young for doing that. The average age of men and women in the program was like 54, so I was like the baby around, (laughs) But, (laughs) but hey, it's the blessings of the Lord, amen? So it shouldn't seem so strange that I would be doing something at 72 that you're supposed to be doing (laughs) when you're 26. (laughs) But, uh, hey, God is so good. And uh, this is really a faith uh, journey. And the Lord put the aviation ministry in my heart uh, years ago. As a matter of fact, I saw a vision of it when I was uh, eight years old and other ministry things. So I'm still trying to fulfill that. So I know I'm going to live a long time because I like a little ways getting to what I've already seen, amen. Uh, but uh, I think uh, maybe late part of 2018, Brother Ken and I were talking and about the aviation ministry, and we decided it's a time for that to be uh, expedited, so to speak. So we put some faith into it and sowed some seed, and it wasn't just a few months that there was a family that gave me a nice airplane, and uh, that's pretty good to have a plane uh, given to you. As a matter of fact, uh, they've been so gracious, uh, every year they've been paying for the annual on it. (laughs) And they've already said they're going to pay for it this next year. So, hey, isn't it the Lord good? Now, Now, we mixed faith. We got our faith out there working. And also, I sowed seed for that specific purpose. But God honored that. And then the monies for the flight training and all of that, God just uh, supernaturally provided it. And I think he gave me favor with the flight instructors and the examiners. So (laughs) So it's just a God thing. Uh, And so we're thankful to the Lord. And we feel really humbled Uh, that the Lord would uh, help us like that and use us. So my word for tonight, uh, no, it's all right. Brother Ken gave me 20 minutes, so I don't have a clock. So if I go over, it's because I can't see the clock back there. (laughs) Well, actually, I I can see it, maybe. uh, (laughs) Uh, But my word for you tonight is that If you can believe, there will come a day when you will say, how can it be? If you can believe, there will come a day when you will say, how can it be? Amen. And so my thoughts on this came from the book of Mark, chapter number five, when uh, Jairus is there and he has a daughter that's uh, dying and he goes to Jesus. Jesus agrees to come to his house and they're on the way. There's a lot of interference, people getting healed and receiving miracles and all of these sorts of things. And then someone comes up with a message and it says, you don't need to trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. And as soon as Jesus heard those words, 
And it's important that you know, as he said, as soon as he heard it, we're not giving any time, any place for this to take root. Amen. He counteracted that and he told the man, he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And so I began to meditate on that, and I realized in our walk with the Lord, one of the devil's main objectives and main tools is to get fear in your heart. Amen. Now, when I was a kid, we had out- outdoor toilets, and I don't think young people even know what that was. But I remember as a little boy, I was afraid of the dark. And when you got outdoor toilets and you're afraid of the dark... Uh, That was torment. (laughs) So, and the Bible said fear has torment with it, right? Well, I was tormented by that. And you could get business done quickly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There wasn't any hanging around. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But that was torment. Well, the devil doesn't have to get that kind of fear in your heart. But if he can just get a little bit of fear, just enough, just enough to stop your faith. And anytime you have a new assignment and God's always having you to do something that you've never done before, he's doing things that takes faith, it expands you. And the devil's always trying to get fear in your heart. I can't do it. You know, I believe many people miss major blessings Because they let fear get in their heart. You know, God gives you thoughts. He gives you ideals. You're sowing. You're giving money. God's trying to get money to you. But it doesn't grow on trees. Sometimes you have to do something. And so God gives us a thought. Gives us an opportunity. And we hear it. But the devil tries to get a little fear. You know, one of the things that people fear a lot is, What if I fail? What if I fail? Well, what if you don't? (laughs) You know, if you look at people that are very successful, you normally find they've had lots of failures. It's not a question of whether you fail or how many times you fail. It's a question, do you get up and keep on going? Amen. And so the devil fights fear, and our job is to believe. To believe. If you want to receive God's best, you've got to believe what the Word of God says. You have to believe that you are who God says you are. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. It doesn't matter what the world says. The question is, what does God say? Who does He say I am? Amen. The world may say, you're too old to do this. The world may say, you're too young to get a Ph.D. degree. But what does God say about you? God says we're kings and we're priests. God says that even now, beloved, what manner of love the Father have bestowed upon us that we are called the sons of God. You have to believe that I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God, that I have a kingship anointing and authority, that I have a priesthood authority and anointing on my life. I'm who God says I am. And if I'm who God says I am, I can do anything that he asks me to do. And if he gives me an opportunity, if he asks me to do it, then he believes that I'm well able to do it. You got to get that in your mind. Get fear behind you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And if you can do that, there come a day when you're saying, how could this be? How could this be? How could a boy from rural Arkansas have a Ph.D. degree at age 26 and my dad believed education was good, but he didn't fund it? I didn't have any family funding to get my education. We come from rural Arkansas way back in the sticks. I don't even know if anybody in my family have heard of a Ph.D. degree. Certainly nobody had ever received one, and I look back a few hundred years. 
as if you can only believe. Then there come a day when you'll say, how can this be? How can this be? How can I have an airplane? I don't have any money. <laughs> I have a heavenly account. You know, God is so good. I live like a rich man and I don't have any money. <laughs> I hadn't quite figured out how that works. Travel all over the world, have memberships and exclusive hunting clubs, all these sorts of things like that. How, how can that be? I don't have any money. I don't know what I'd do differently if I was rich. <laughs> Amen. But in God, we are rich. Amen. God is a good God. You just have to believe. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Believe that you are who God says you are. I got about three more minutes left. I'm watching the clock. Now, I was preaching this over in Arkansas at a camp meeting. And the Lord dropped something else in my heart. He says, one of the reasons that you've had success is because there's always been someone that believed in you. You see, in this belief, it's not only important that we believe the Word of God, but we have to believe in one another. Even Jesus, the Son of God, ran into problems when people didn't believe in him. When he went to his hometown, the people didn't question the miracles. They just didn't want to believe in Jesus. And Jesus couldn't do much. But if you have someone that believes in you, someone that believes in you, that is so empowering. So I thought back at things that God's helped me accomplish. I always had someone, it's always someone that believed in me. They were saying, hey, you can do it. We have faith in you. We believe in you. Oh, what a difference that it makes. I was thinking about the CF. I don't know if I could have got that if Brother Ken hadn't believed in me. He had more faith in me than I had. <laughs> Amen. But it makes a difference. You know, I remember as a kid, and first day on the tractor, 80-acre field by myself, and everybody just left. And there's a moment that's kind of a little bit of a fear to it. And then I remembered the boss man. And I'm thinking... Man, he believed I could do this. He really believed in me. He had, I mean, he done drove off. I didn't see them until noon. <laughs> 11 year old kid, 80 acre field all by yourself. <laughs> but you know, that did something to me. Yep. I'm thinking, man, he really believed I can do this. Yep. And I made up my mind, yep, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it better than what the old men do. I'm going to cover more land. My furrows are going to be straighter. Why? Because somebody believed in me. And you know, I was good. I was so good the next year. I mean, I'm 12 years old. And this farmer bought a brand new tractor. And guess what? He put me on it. The 12 year old. <laughs> now, there was some old men that got their feathers a little rougher. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody believed. I remember the first time that I prayed for someone that was sick. I was about 10 years old. My mother come down with a terrible, terrible headache. And I heard her call out, Ronnie, come in here. Ronnie Dale. And she said, Dale, that's my middle name. You knew this was a pressing matter. <laughs> Better pay attention. I thought maybe she wanted me to get a glass of water or something. And I went up to her bedside. She said, Ronnie, pray for me. I'm like, what? 
I mean, I've been in church all my life, but I never prayed. I mean, that's good for the preacher to do. See that little bit of fear? How can I pray for somebody? And I remember she reached up and she grabbed my hand and she put it on her head and she said, Ronnie Dale, I said, pray for me. And I did. I asked the Lord to heal my mama. It wasn't about 10 minutes. She was up completely healed. You see, somebody believed in me. I remember the first pastor that asked me to come and preach a revival. I mean, I'd never done anything like that. There's a little fear. Devil tries to get a little fear. But somebody believed in me. I remember the first time I gave a call for sick people to come and be healed. And you know what? They actually came. <laughs> I heard the devil trying to put that fear like, all right, what are you going to do now? People actually came up. I've never done that before. Then the first lady, so I'm trying to get my faith up and we're getting here. And I went up and asked her what she needed and she said, I'm blind. I said, God, this... <laughs> I mean, first of all, people actually came and couldn't I like start on a headache or, or something's backache or, or something simple? <laughs> first person you're going to pray for publicly is blind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. If you can only believe. I left that revival thinking, how could this be? How could this be? People that hadn't worked in six years, their backs was healed and able to go to work. All sorts of, how could that be? If you only believe. Fear not. Fear not and only believe. And there come a day when you'll say, how could this be? Good. Amen. You got to believe. You got to believe. Amen. You got to believe. Father, we thank you that we believe. We believe. We believe. I thank you that we believe. I thank you that we believe. That's why they call us believers. Because we believe. Won't you close your eyes? I want you just to absorb that word. I want you to, the thing that's caused fear that's keeping you out of the things that you feel and know that God has put before you. It may be getting a degree or whatever the case is, but you decide, I'm going to push fear aside right now. I'm going to push fear aside. I believe. I believe. I believe. Father, many men have said, how can this be? Even Jesus, they, they said the same thing. How can this be? Who can open the blinded eyes? Who can speak with such authority? What manner of man is this? Father, I pray right now for a supernatural anointing to be upon your people to believe and to receive to believe and to receive to believe and to receive lord we honor you and we thank you we honor you and we thank you in the name of jesus we refuse to be refused in our dreams we deny to be denied because of fear trying to control our life father we thank you we thank you we thank you. We're not just asking Brother Ron to share just a scripture. We receive. We absorb that. We believe. We believe. We believe. We believe now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're believers. Amen. You know, fear is a thing. It, it is. Fear is a thief and fear is a robber. That's what it does. I told this story many, uh, I, don't, I don't remember I told it many times because it wasn't really applicable to some of the things that I preach. But 
uh, back in, uh, I don't know, 80, it was the 85, 86 year at Ramah. And uh, some, some boys that were in the second year was getting ready to graduate. So it, it was in 86, I did a graduate in May of 86. And getting ready to graduate, and they, uh, people helped them get a tent, and they were going to go uh, do tent revivals, true evangelists, miracles, and different things, two true tent revivals. And uh, so with that and what they were doing, uh, they set up on this side of Tulsa that wasn't very safe. It wasn't very safe. It's almost like, you know, setting up a tent maybe over on the west side of, you know, or something like that. It's not a, it wasn't something that you would just do. But they wanted to reach people. They wanted to to do it. And uh, Keith Moore and several of them were preaching in that meeting. And uh, they had like a, started off with like a Holy like like a Holy Ghost night and different things such. And uh, they needed someone. It was, it was going all week. They needed someone to uh, sleep in that tent or stay there to uh, be a presence in that tent so people wouldn't, you know, come and borrow. And uh, so I said that no, no one would do it. And I said, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I went and he says, okay, the, one of the, one of the preachers, they were already married at Raymond said, my wife will be here at, uh, seven in the morning and, uh, she'll, uh, she'll relieve you. There'll be a group of people coming and praying for the service that's taking place. And I'm telling you what, I've never fought such fear in my life. I didn't know crickets could be so big <laughs> and so loud. I mean, it, it was, it was terrible. It was, it was terrible. I had a flashlight that I turned on and pointed straight up and, uh, and of course the batteries wasn't good enough and they didn't last very long. And it was a miserable night of sleep, miserable night of sleep. I mean, I mean, I was chasing, chasing things in my imaginations that didn't exist. People could have laughed at me and said, I can't believe that you did that. But they, they, they didn't volunteer to stay. Come on. And so uh, the next night I got there and I remember loud. Things were loud. Fear tried to grip my heart. I mean, I literally caused you to skip a breath. Somebody come in here and kill you. Somebody could come in here. You're responsible. Da, 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 da. And so I remember you saying out loud, no, I'd rather die anyway than to live in this kind of fear. And I remember the peace of God came up when I went to sleep. But fear will keep you out. I thought that one act of volunteer, that one act of obedience, God's rewarded me so many times over that. God's rewarded. See, people see some of the things you have and what you do, but it's the small things that you agree to do and obedient to do uh, for God to set you up in things. Uh, I had, a, I had a friend of mine tell me one day, he says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into ministry. He said, but I'm waiting to be a pastor. No, you, there's, you, can, you work with the youth. Nope. I felt called to be a pastor. Well, you could be an associate. Nope. They do all the dirty work. That's what he told me. They do all the dirty work. I wasn't pastoring then, so I didn't know. I know that I didn't do all the dirty work with dad, so they do all the dirty work. I said, no, but you know, uh, you can ask him today how it worked out for him. It didn't, it didn't work out because you got to be willing to do that. That's what I love about brother Ron. Uh, he's never tried to be somebody else. And not only did he get a PhD, but he taught at the university of Arkansas. He taught at middle state, Tennessee. He taught at the Citadel. And uh, you're talking high level education that's not common. So I, I've said this many times, don't, don't misinterpret what you see on the outside. Because on the inside, it's a different situation. See, that's what happened with Jesus. People looked on the outside and saw him just as another man, a carpenter. Rough hands, 
a worker with his hands, a carpenter's son. But on the inside, he was God. It was glory. So don't just be moved by what you see. Be moved by what you believe. And you've got to believe in the word of God. So don't allow fear to manipulate you at all. I'm in this area of Kenya back many years ago, and I was out on the East Coast. And it's bad now, but it was bad then. It's really bad now in this area. And I had to have, there was this uh, Samburu guy, the Maasai, like Samburu would walk me through this little wooded area uh, to get to this little uh, motel, hotel. I told you they rented it more by the hour than they did by the day. And it was a real bad, rough area. And, um, and so I went and I always stayed in the same room, put in the same room every time I was there. And I'd be there like eight, nine weeks, would go in and out, stay in a couple of places, doing, comp, comp, uh, doing uh, open air meetings. But they brought me back in this one room that uh, the door to the outside didn't lock. And there's nobody there to switch rooms. And now this wasn't in a gated area. Whoo! I'm glad I had that experience in Tulsa. Because I had to, I had to pull out the same ammunition right there. All kind of noises. All kind of noises. There's an American in that room. He's got to have money. You know? But I'm telling you what, fear will control your life if you don't get it. And no matter where you are, you still got to deal with it over and over and over and over again. Amen. So fear not, fear not, fear not. Just believe. And then you will say, I love that. How can this be? Isn't that good? How could this be? How can this happen? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? All right, anybody got a Bible with you tonight? How about turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 20? Yeah! Ezekiel chapter 20. Brother Ron has been putting me through a workout. Uh, there's, uh, there's maneuvers you can do, and then there's more intense maneuvers you can do. And so he's been putting me through the more intense. And, uh, and yesterday and today, and it was... Uh, Today turned out pretty well. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Fear not. Fear not. Amen. Yes. Yes, we have uh, stalled and stalled and restalled. Uh, it was, uh, we have uh, done a plenty of stall training. And uh, we have done plenty of, st- but I accept I didn't have to cry out. Angel's going to kill me. We got through all of that mess, but it has been a, uh, it's been a, it's been a time together in that. Uh, did I, did I say chapter 20? I meant 22. Verse 20, uh, chapter 22, verse 20. I know there's a, uh, 20 in there somewhere. There's power in a prayer of agreement. Brother, brother Ron and I have agreed in prayer over the, some of these things in aviation. We have agreed. We have agreed in prayer. I remember sitting in his living room. This is all part of the teaching now. Sat in his living room. He had a little 152 uh, that we were flying. That's the one I put it in the spin, uh, that deep spiral. But we were in his living room, and we were talking about airplanes. And, and, uh, and he kept, we kept talking about this one, the 172s, which is a four-seater, but, a, you know. Uh, then he talked about 182s, and we just dreamed and dreamed. And, uh, and lo and behold, about everything we have we've prayed about and agreed upon over the years. It's like we are involved in it and we're having them and we're flying them. And so God is so faithful. I'm telling you what, it works. It works. It works. Amen. And so talking about the prayer of agreement, the prayer of agreement is powerful. It's like when I meet you in the hotel, in the hospital and we pray over you before surgery and whatever, it's not just praying, uh, praying for an anointing to be upon you. There is an agreement with that. That we agree, that we'll agree that things will be supernatural, that things will be a quick recovery. We'll agree. Two people have to agree. Amen. And Jesus in the midst of it. So uh, we dealt with that and dealt with the subject of the uh, binding and loosing, how you can bind and loosen what, and what it is. Uh, you can't bind me. You, you, you can't bind me. I mean, I've seen people uh, tell somebody, I bind you. Well, you can't bind me. I mean, uh, I can tell somebody I bind you, and they can still run their mouth all they want. Amen? 
So you, you can do that. Now, there's times I have dealt with that spirit. I've, I've bound that spirit operating through people. I remember I went through a time where I, I prayed in the same place and uh, prayed. Uh, I knew this was a situation many, many years ago. And I just kept praying and kept praying and kept praying. Uh, the Bible says that no man can go into a house unless he first bind the strong man. And so dealing with that, we didn't go into all those verses because Bible study is to give you an opportunity for you to go ahead and uh, continue to work on it. And what we do and teach, it's not, it's not all inclusive. You have to be able to get it out and look at it and still study. But you got to bind the, no man can, can pillage another man's house or do that unless he binds a strong man, the man that, that, that guards it and, and so forth. And so what happened was I sat there and continued to speak. I command in the name of Jesus, I command that demon or that spirit operating through so-and-so that's causing this to happen. I name one, two, three. I command you to stop your operation through this man, uh, uh, whatever it is. And I did that enough until that spirit was broke and then I never had a conflict with the man was able to work things out scripturally because there's something about binding something, loosing the presence of God, loosing God in that. And so people try to attack the flesh. You you, you can't bind the flesh. You you crucify the flesh. You, You don't bind your flesh. You crucify it. And I cannot bind your flesh, but we can deal with the spirit that's driving you. We can deal with the spirit that's influencing you. Amen. That's what it is. Well, de- dealing with the prayer of agreement, because I said there's, there's prayers that change things. There's prayers that you can do to change things. Now, we're talking about changing things. And n- number one, I love this introduction to it because you've got to be able to stay out of fear to change anything. And so when you talk about the prayer of agreement, you've got to believe. You can't be in fear. When you talk about the prayer of binding and loosing, you've got to believe. You can't be in fear. You cannot allow fear to dominate. So I want to talk about another one. Uh, this evening that I really believe in the time that we're living in that people really must understand the word intercession, the word intercession, different things is coming up, different meetings coming up with the missions conference and all this coming up. We have to understand the word intercession. This is a, this is a prayer. Uh, I could ask Brother Ron, I want you to agree with me. He'll say, Brother Ken, you, you, you agree with me. We, we can agree with each other. I can agree with you. Uh, somebody call me, Pastor, I want you to agree with me. We can agree. And that prayer of agreement may be your, for your benefit or that prayer of agreement may be for my benefit. If we bind and loose something, there may be something badgering you. That prayer of binding and loosing with that agreement can be to your benefit or it can be to my benefit. But this prayer of intercession, this intercession is not about the one who's praying. The other prayers can benefit you. This is not about you. Matter of fact, this might be one of the most uncomfortable prayers that you ask God to use you in. Some people are anointed for intercession. They were called intercessors. Matter of fact, they changed the name back in the 80s from intercessors to prayers. And people become prayers. And uh, sometimes it's the ones who kept it right and stayed in the realm of submission to God. And the, those who God put over them became very successful as intercessors. The ones who started thinking, I'm an intercessor. I know more now than the pastor. God has shown me things. Matter of fact, matter of fact, God shows me so many things that uh, that's even wrong with you. Well, those people got stuck on stoop and they don't last. They shipwreck. They entertain spirits. Amen? They, they do that. And so with this, this intercession is not about you. You know, a lot of people pray, but most of the prayer is about them. Most of the prayer is about them. How bad it is, how hard it is, how difficult it is, what I need, what I need, what I need, what I need. Give me, 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 praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Give me, give me. No, that's not intercession. Intercession is taking the place of another. Even at your own position of being uncomfortable. I was talking with the young adults in their class, and I was talking about this. Brother Jeff Rotz wanted me to share, and I, I brought this up. This word intercession means to take the middle place, to take the middle position. I remember... Some of the cars my dad had, no one wanted to ride in the middle. It was a hump. And it was always hot. 
And you always fought to get by the door because nobody liked that middle place, especially that little Corvair that he had. That middle place was terrible. You would fight to say, I'm not sitting in the middle. No one wanted the middle. I don't even like the middle place on an airplane. I don't like crawling over people. And uh, when you're sleeping, I don't like people crawling over me. So in that middle position, it's not a comfortable position to be in. People say, I'm not going to get between you and that. Two people fussing. I'm not going to get between that. Why? Because the middle position is terrible. Don't get me in the middle of that. And I think the reason why the prayer of agreement is so attractive, the binding and loosing understand is so good, this intercession, don't get me in the middle of that. But this is the part that we got to get in the middle of. With our government, our city, our churches. Come on, our children. It's called intercession. Now, just be, there's two ways to look at this intercession. I am going to read this verse. There's two ways to look at this intercession. It's just praying on behalf of someone else. But I found out intercession is a time where the Holy Ghost will come and take a hold together with you and pray things that you didn't know that needed to be prayed about. I know there may be something wrong in a situation, but there was intercession. I remember it happened with my kids. I remember when Brittany pulled out, she was working at uh, Jack's Pet Store over there. Was it Jack's then? And uh, she crossed 49 and got side hit. Um, I mean 40, I'm sorry, 49, that's where I'm from. 40 and got side hit. And I, I remember right about, to, not long before that, this burden for my daughter came up in me. And I didn't know what was going on. I just began to pray, begin 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 to pray. And it wasn't long after that, she calls me. So sometimes what seemed to be, you know, not so serious could have been really serious. If when we yield to the things of God, things become easier and better. But this intercession... A lot of people will never engage in it. We can talk about it, you know, teach about it. But to take this position is not comfortable. It's not that Jesus hung. Jesus, there's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He stood between sinful man and holy God and became that sacrifice. That place, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that was not a comfortable position. Matter of fact, he said, if there's any other way that this thing could pass from me, let it be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And I think that when it comes to this church, the plans and purpose God has for us, I believe that there's got to be prayers of intercession. Because the enemy will do everything he can to resist, to cause things not to happen. People can say, well, I thought it was the will of God. It could have been the will of God, but people did not pray for the will of God to be released. Even though Elijah heard the sound of rain, even though he heard it, he said, go go tell it. Or even though God, he knew that rain was going to come. He said, go tell me what you see. He still went to the mountain and prayed. There's something about praying that makes a difference. There's something about praying. God said he knows the things that we need before we ask, but still ask. I saw this in the spirit one day. We're still going to read this verse. I saw this in the spirit one day where churches, even this church, goes into a cycle. It's a cycle. All of a sudden you get to the place where my God, we're on the cusp of things. And then, whoop, you go, you go into an, another cycle. People become lethargic, strife, disunity. And I prayed. I've walked in this sanctuary, and I've prayed, and I've attacked that and dealt with that, dealt with that and attacked that, because somewhere down the line, you've got to break out of these things. And if the church of Jesus Christ, not just local assemblies, if the church of Jesus Christ is ever going to be what God wants it to be, 
Or let me put it this way. If we never become what we're supposed to be, we have nobody to blame but us. Because hurt feelings, laziness, uh, can't have it my way. This one looked at me wrong. And if we don't receive the things we receive, it's not because it's not God's will. It's because God's people will come in agreement with the enemy who wants to stop it. And the brakes will go on. Well, I've never agreed with the devil. Every time you get into strife, you are. Every time you choose to not forgive, you are. Every time you choose to do it your own way, Cain, you are. It's coming to agreement with the enemy. But this intercession is coming to agreement with God and letting God pray his will, not our will. Amen. Would anybody like for us to read verse 20? <laughs> for I sought for a man or a woman. It's not just gender. 22. Did I get it right? 2220. Ezekiel. Oh, 30. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I told you there. 2230. That's why angel's here. That's why she helps me. Matter of fact, I have a line drawn through my where I got an arrow, and uh, my three's covered over anyway. So when I looked at 29, I knew that had to be 30. For I sought for a man among you. I can always tell when I'm not doing it right. People look around. What you got? What you got? What is it? For I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. And stand in the gap before me and on the behalf of the land. That I should not destroy it. And I found a multitude. What does your Bible say? None. I'm sorry, Lord, that you couldn't find one man. Isn't that sad? And he found none. Now, if he was looking here tonight, he would find some, right? Amen. He'd find some. That's right. But he said, I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with, my, with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. So this whole thing, there's many parts in there where God was looking for someone. We said, you know, make up a hedge, stand in the gap. But this stand in the gap becomes so important to what we know when it comes to this intercession. It's so important to do that. Now, back over in the New Testament, we have used this. Uh, the times where we were doing prayer and different things like that in 1 Timothy. I mean, really, 1 Timothy. And, uh, and I mean, really, chapter 2. And I really mean verse 1. Therefore, I it says, therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings. So now, when you look at this, I, I, I went, old, went round and round with, with uh, some people. Some people can be very smart in the brain, very intelligent, very intelligent. That it can hinder them from seeing spiritual things. Thank God I've never had that issue. Not seeing spiritual things, but being over intelligent. But some people can be very intelligent that everything has got to make sense. If it don't make sense in their head, they can't do it. It can't do it. Uh, it it's just it difficult. And so, but it says... For men, comma, for kings. And all, all it was, I preached one time that I believe this was a order that we should pray. First of all, kings, those are in authority. I don't believe that's what it means. I believe it could be in any order. That doesn't mean that, that it's going to be kings. And I just wanted to keep fussing and fussing. And there's nothing to fuss about. First of all, I exhort thee. That was supplication, prayers, and intercession, and giving the thanks be made for all men. And I believe, on purpose, 
he says kings. We don't have a king here. We have, in the United States, we have presidents. Presidents. Some presidents have been easier to pray for than others. As Pastor Barkley said, we've had a lot of good presidents, and we've had a lot of bad presidents, and we've had a lot of presidents. They're just been presidents. For kings, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meter between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all. So Jesus was that mediator between God and man. He was the one in the middle. And so I really believe that this is a part when it comes to praying for kings, for rulers. Now, some of the countries I've been in, they don't have presidents. They are kingdoms. They're kingdoms. When I was in Thailand, they didn't have a president. Thailand has a king. It's a kingdom. When Scott and I have been to, to uh, Swaziland, or now Iswatini they call it, Swaziland is not governed by a president, it's governed by a king, it's a kingdom, and the king owns everything. He's the king. And so, we don't have a king here, but we have presidents. I made it such a, I made it such a priority. Uh, I remember sitting in the house uh, I was staying with Pastor David Shipman's parents years ago. I was doing a revival out there. And it was over, it was at the second inauguration of Bush 2. And uh, I was sitting there as they were having the inauguration day and different things like that in January. I was there and, and uh, I was watching that and I got so convicted because I didn't really pray for him like I should have in the first term. And I got so convicted that I said, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen the second term. And not only in that same year, 9-11 broke out. He didn't have time to really get settled in. He wasn't hardly doing his, you know, his tour where he's still waving, you know, waving hands and kissing babies. And then you go into a war that we've been in for ever since on this. Every president's dealt with this. But I made a commitment that I was going to pray. And this is when I got into a place and I began to pray and taking this in that middle position. See, it says, first of all, so I believe that God will honor, I believe, what we honor by faith. And I would start praying. I would come into a place and, and uh, sometime I'd have music and sometime I wouldn't. But there were certain music that I could pray to, not sing to. Sometimes music will cause you to sing in worship and not prayer. Even though worship becomes a part of prayer, uh, don't allow certain worship music for you to just have a worship service in it because you can miss the point of why you're there. Now, worship has its place, but prayer has its pr place. That's why we, back in early this year, uh, on the Sunday evenings, I said we're going to do three things. We're going to worship we're going to pray and we're going to receive communion because, you know, I find it myself. There's sometimes I go into prayer and I just worship. I come up with my own words. You'll never hear them. You won't receive them like he did. But I begin to worship. I begin to sing unto the Lord. And sometimes I'll spend, I'll spend 30 minutes or longer just singing unto the Lord. Because it's what it is. When it comes to prayer, prayer, I can have music in the background, but I don't want music to replace my praying. You with me? I don't want music to replace my praying. And so I would say, after I get to the place of, of honoring God, I always came into his gates with things even as corpse of praise. I would I want to just let you come in for a minute on some things that I've done. People say, well, that's kind of redundant. Well, it wasn't always the same praying the same thing. So maybe the format I did, I, w I would come in and, and worship God a minute. I always worship God a minute. But when I switched to prayer, I quit singing. I'd worship God. 
And I said, God, I thank you. I thank you that your spirit is released in this area. If it's in my own bedroom, my own house, my own living room, down in the basement where I live, uh, wherever, I thank you that your spirit is released in here, that, uh, that we're going to be able to pray and, and fellowship one with another, and you're going to lead me and guide me. And, <clears throat> and before I ever prayed about Ken Harbaugh, before I ever prayed about my family, before I prayed about the money, before I prayed about that, I always try to take care of this first. That's why I say, first of all, you said, first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks, especially giving of thanks because it's the will of God for my life that I give thanks. You said giving thanks, the will of God for me uh, concerning things. So I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. And then I say, Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the president. Now, Lord, I, I, I don't agree with the decisions being made if it's not there. I don't agree with decisions being made. But the office that which he holds, I pray over that because that makes decision. We've got to live a quiet and peaceable life. Well, if we don't live a quiet and peaceable life, if they put the quietus on the preaching, if they stop the preaching of it, if they stop this, we can't get it done. All of the things that came out by this, by, 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 by this, um, uh, correctness. Well, what is that? Uh, huh? Political correctness. See, all of that hindered a lot of preaching. You can't preach on this. You can't preach on that. You can't do. You can't talk about biblical things, the same-sex marriage and homosexuality and everything's in there because biblical correctness says you can't do that. But we've got to be able to be free to preach the gospel, not with condemnation or shame, but out of a power of deliverance. Got to be able to do it. You got to be able to do it. There's not a family here that don't know somebody that's attached to your family that doesn't need some kind of touch from heaven. God's not willing that any should perish. And you shouldn't will that any should perish. Father, I thank you. I pray for the president. I pray. I pray, Father, there's people that brings information to him. He doesn't know everything going on. He depends on everybody. He, people that whispers into his ears, people that tell him things. I thank you that the words that bring confusion, the lies that causes him to make decisions don't need to be made. I command those words to fall to the ground. I pray that he gets the right information. I pray that he gets the right words and things that happens. I pray for him. I pray for his family. I pray for his cabinet. I pray for the cabinet that he picks. Father, the cabinet members, I know some of them will go, go against your very law. Some will go against your very moral things but I pray for their cabinet I pray for wisdom come up on them the things that they receive the information they get the people that influence them the lobbyists that influence them I pray that they would come to their knees and realize that you are Lord and and I pray for the the lobbyist and and uh, I, I pray for those in authority and 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 the people that he has to put in the cabinet and and then I pray for the legislator I pray for the judicial system uh, I would pray for both sides of the aisles and and I would go from from the federal government I I'd go to the state government. I'd pray for the city government. I'd pray for the law enforcement, teachers. Teachers are in a place of authority dealing with our kids. And I would just take time to cover that. But you can't just rush in and rush out to cover that. You've got to be able to find this to be very important or very serious to the heart of God. And so I believe this intercession is not about this is what I need. God knows what I need. And when I finish that, I begin to thank God. And I said, Lord, there's things I don't know how to pray. I don't know about what's going on. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what kind of attack is that it's upon our country or whatever it is. And I just pray in the Holy Ghost because he knows if I find a man's willing to take that middle place, I'll use him, I'll pray through him and get that. To help people. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll use him and I'll pray. And then I can pray. When all that's done. Father I thank you. Now you know there's needs. In this household. You know there's things that we're believing for. I thank you that I believe that we receive. I thank you that. I thank you for it. I thank you. Naturally. Naturally. It, it, it can't happen. Just natural. It's got to be supernatural. It's got to be Supernatural. It's got to be supernatural. And you just begin to pray for that. But first things has got to be first. First things are first. And I, I really believe, and I want to admonish you and you that are streaming. We can't, at this stage of the game, be the hindrance of keeping back the plane of God. 
for this time, our life, this church, and your family. You've got to work with God, not against God. You've got to work with God, not, not against God. You know, the Bible talks about praying in vain repetition. We, you know, all of us could get into that and vain repetition. But I'm not dealing with vain repetition. There's times where I, it's all I did was just pray for a certain part. I got to praying for a certain part of, of the country one day, and that's all I did. I finished up praying. Never got to har bombs. Never got to it. But I believe I prayed the will of God for that. See, the Bible said if you give, it shall be given. Press down, shaking together, running over. I just believe sometime what you sow comes back to you. And because I didn't get to my family, I'm just as convinced that God moved up on somebody. Didn't know who they were praying for. He's praying for my family. Come on. So I'm never left out. You're never cheated when you prefer somebody else over you. And then I'll tag on to what Brother Ron said. And you can look back and say, how can this be? I don't remember even praying about it. How can this be? How can God do this? Amen. Folks, the truth is, love is the best way to go. That's why I tell you all the time, I love and appreciate you. I do it because I care. I do it because I mean it. I care about your, about your outcome. I care about what's in your heart. I care about what God has placed before you to do. I care about that. And I carry it in my heart. It's not about me just coming in here and preaching. It's not about what I do. I care about you. God wants you blessed. He wants you free from stress. And he wants you to walk in victory all the days of your life. Amen. So I moved this up. I actually was going to, uh, the thing that was going to deal with first was, was the word petition. But I moved intercession up. To tonight because I really believe in my heart that we can't lose any more time standing and praying. We can't lose any more time. And I'm already looking at it. Angel and I have been talking about it for several days now. I'm already looking at it on how we're going to start offering more opportunities here and uh, for people to pray to stand in the gap because I want us to fulfill And please God in everything that he's put before us. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Come on.